I make them. <laughs> and I don't remember where I got the pa where I got the material. It was yeah, a fabric store over in the children's section, probably. <laughs> I'm not joking. I mean, this is definitely the kind of pattern you find in the children's section, and you bring it home, and your wife says, you're not going to make a shirt out of that, are you? Yeah, I am. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I, ha I haven't made shirts for a few years now because I was too busy with other things, and I need, I'm trying to clear some space right now because I'm not quick. I'm not like... You know, people go, oh, you could, could you do that? You could do that profession. It's like, no, I'm very slow. It would not, it would not work. Okay, and a glass of water would be great. That would be a, the totality I needed. And I guess I need, yeah, that's what this is for. It's for the glass of water. It's going to be perfect. Yep. And thank you so much for doing this. Oh, yeah, it was. It was. Yeah, very pleased to have I'm you here. I'm making it work. Um, it's been too long. Now's the time. It's been. It's my own fault. There haven't been any books since the last time I was here well, that there I've you done. Go, but that's great, then we're two for two. So you do have a place to put this. Yep. I'm going to go ahead and give you your own dedicated pitcher of water because I have another one for all the rest of you to share. This is the poisoned one everyone else gets. <laughs> Nobody will sell his book after this journey. Okay, this is the book. This is the book. Jelly Roll Blues Censored Songs and Hidden Histories. <laughs> All right, it's going to balance here pretty well. I have some more copies at the front. Elijah Wells, uh, I'm just going to give him the floor. He's the fellow that wrote this book. Did you know that? <laughs> Glad you all came out. Thank right, you. and that's what I'm here. The guitar is just a prop. I'm here to talk about the book. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the book. So, what happened? We were actually just talking about this. In 2003, this finally the complete Jelly Roll Morton Library of Congress recordings with Alan Lomax came out. And I happened at that moment to be living in Los Angeles where I had gone to do a project on Chicano gangster rap. And there was Jelly Roll Morton talking about what he had done in 1907 or thereabouts in any case, the first decade of the 20th century, and it was exactly the same language I was hearing in the streets. And I was particularly struck by a song he did called The Murder Ballad, or rather, a song he did that Alan Lomax titled The Murder Ballad, um, which was a narrative ballad in 12-bar blues form that the whole thing didn't get recorded. It starts sort of in mid-song, but what did get recorded uh, was 59 verses and half an hour long. <laughs> and it had been recorded in 1938 as an example of the sort of thing he used to sing at the turn of the century, but wasn't released until for the first time the mid to late 1990s because it had lines like the heroine, the protagonist, uh, who is at the beginning of where it picks up, threatening this woman who has been sleeping with her man. And the threats are, I'll cut your fucking throat and drink your blood like wine. <laughs> I'll cut your throat, bitch, and drink your fucking blood like wine, because you know he's a man of mine. Um, and the thing that fascinated me, uh, a, a number of things fascinated me about that. First of all, that none of us, I was a blues historian, no blues historian knew that there had ever been such a thing as an epic narrative ballad in 12-bar blues form. Because the only one that had ever been recorded had been suppressed because it used language like that. The second thing that was interesting to me is it wasn't a dirty song. I mean, there's nothing dirty about I'll drink your fucking blood like wine. It's just the way people talked in bars. 
And that led to the thought, so how much else don't we have? Because it was in the normal language that people spoke in the environments that blues was played and therefore could not be recorded or published. And so I spent years and years and years um, going into archives and going looking for the papers of the earliest collectors and the interviews with guys who'd been around then, just trying to see how much of that stuff in fact did survive. And it turned out quite a lot. Um, and the interesting, well, among the interesting things was a lot of absolutely filthy verses that had never been published, not only survived, but survived in versions all across the South. So clearly this stuff was completely common all across the South. Um, a song called Uncle Bud, for example, um, which basically doesn't exist in the, no I mean, there are mentions of it, but it didn't really have a melody, so there was no point in cleaning it up. You know, like Hesitation Blues, there are all these filthy versions, but you could also do a clean version because it was a fun thing to sing. But Uncle Bud kind of had no melody, so there was no point if you didn't do the dirty version. But you find Zora Neale Hurston recording it in Florida and folklorists recording it in Texas, and it's exactly the same verses. So it's known all across the South completely through the oral tradition. So what I did with this book is, first of all, I was just fascinated in seeing how much of this stuff there was and doing the history of the songs and exhuming the songs. And then that led into the question of, so who was singing these? Where were they singing these? Who were they singing these for? And just sort of asking. Um, the, the guy named Lewis Mumford, when, when I was growing up, he was actually a friend of my folks. And he was a really sweet guy. And uh, I, I loved him as a human being. But he wrote a book um, back in the 60s, I believe, could have been the 50s, called The Myth of the Machine. Uh, and his point was, if you read all these histories of human development, they talk about man, the tool-making animal, and how people started making tools. And then as they got agriculture, that led to this and that and the other. And he says, well, the thing is, tools are what we can dig up. So we dig up all these tools, and then we invent this narrative based on the things we can dig up. And they're important to us because they're all we have. But there's no reason to think that that's, in fact, how society progressed, rather than through social interactions that we can't dig up. And I was profoundly affected by that because we've written so much music history based on records. And records are not what people played. Records are what recording companies could sell, which is a completely different thing than what people, I mean, there are musicians in the room. I mean, what you play on gigs and what survives on record of your playing are completely different things. Um, you know, every blues player played How Long Blues. Very few recorded How Long Blues because they were already records, you know, because Leroy Carr had done that. Um, every blues player, classic example of this, um, Sam Charters in the 1960s did a terrific couple of records for Vanguard with Skip James. In the 19, actually I guess the early 2000s, um, there was a release of the unreleased Vanguard recordings by Skip James. It included him doing Hoagie Carmichael's Lazy Bones. Gorgeous version, complete with the bridge. It's beautiful. And I happened to be talking to Sam a little after that and said, you know, I just heard that, that recording, you know, the CD came out with that m version of Lazy Bones. He said, oh, God, yeah, that version of Lazy Bones. Oh, God. You know, all those guys, they'd come in wanting to do their version of Honeysuckle Rose, and we'd have to tell them, no, we don't want that. We want blues. <laughs> like, fuck. <laughs> I mean, I understand what he meant. But I understand why he didn't want to release the goddamn recordings 
but I would have. I wish he had recorded more of them. Um, so anyway, that's sort of the genesis of this project. Um, what I did in the book was I basically used Jelly Roll Morton and specifically the Library of Congress recordings as he's sort of Virgil to my Dante. He's the one I'm following through these circles that he knows. And so I use each chapter is, is based off one of the songs he does in the Library of Congress recordings. I start with Alabama Bound, um, which I use as sort of the thread on which to hang how these things spread around the South, just the way people were traveling. And Alabama Bound is a good example. He claimed to have written it, which... I, I'm sorry. Everything, every thought leads me to another thought. So forgive me for the fact that this isn't strictly linear. I, I had this dream of doing Ramblin' Jack Elliott's autobiography. And the way I wanted to do it was one story along the top and the in, his entire life in footnotes, because that's how he talks. I'm finding myself doing more of that. Um, that is, in fact, why he was called that. That's not a joke. Ramblin' Jack Elliott was called that because Odetta's mother saw him approaching her at a party, and oh, here comes that Ramblin' Jack Elliott again. Yes, that is, in fact, why he was called that. Yeah, you know, Dave Van Rock used to refer to him as, as Ramblin' Jack the Village Elliott. Yes. Um, in, sorry, I'm going to make my phone stop making noises because it just made a noise and I wanted to stop. Um, Yes, so Alabama Bound, um, yeah, led to, there's another thing there, which is he said he wrote it, um, Jelly Roll Morton did. The fact is it was already all over the South, but the thing about oral tradition is until these things get written and commodified as objects, everybody did have their version of everything, and it was completely legitimate to say, this is my song, um, because it was. I mean, nobody else did it the way he did it. And I'm not actually, I'm just picking up the guitar. I'm not going to do Alabama Bound right now. Um, but that is the first chapter. The second chapter is Hesitation Blues, and I will do a little bit of that one. Um, Hesitation Blues was the first nationally popular blues song. And that's this book is full of stuff that I simply didn't understand until I <laughs> went researching this. Because like everyone else, I grew up on what had been out on sheet music and what had what had been commodified, sheet music and records. Nowadays God bless the internet, whatever its problems, there are all these newspapers that you can now access. And so you can find things like how incredibly huge Hesitation Blues was in 1915. And it was huge not as a record and not as sheet music. It was huge as something everybody was singing. All the reports of Hesitation Blues, none of them mention it being published. And it was not, in fact, recorded in 1915. But it's a thing that they're singing at football games. They're singing at college events. Their drunks are singing it on the street. People are complaining about drunks who are singing it on the street. Um, it's People are going off to war singing verses about that. And the thing about Hesitation Blues, how many people here know the song? A fair goddamn number, but for those who don't, okay, it basically goes like this. If the river was whiskey, I was a duck, then I'd dive to the bottom and I'd never come up. Tell me how long do I have to wait? 
can I get you now? I must have hit you tea. Well, I've never been to heaven, but I've been told St. Peter taught the angels how to jelly roll. Oh, tell me how long do I have to wait? Can I get you now or must I hesitate? And then there was this formula that distinguished it that everybody did, which is, I ain't no X, I ain't no X, his son, but I can do your Y until the X comes. You know, I ain't no, what a, where you go? I ain't no butcher, no butcher's son, but I can cut your meat until the butcher comes. Oh, tell me how long do I have to wait? And that's an infinitely fillable sort of Mad Libs kind of thing. And so this was a perfect bar song because it's got a chorus that everybody can join in on and then people can throw in verses and make, and because it has this neat formula, they can, in, you, it's easy to generate verses. Everybody in this room, if I asked you to, you, in a couple of seconds, you could think of a profession and figure out something that if you'd had enough drinks would sound dirty. <laughs> and... So it was wildly popular in exactly that way. It was, in fact, it was published in sheet music, and everybody thought of it as a new thing, but nobody sang the verses according to what was in sheet music. The whole point of it was you can all generate verses infinitely and then harmonize on the chorus. And it was, as I say, the first hugely popular blues that has a definition, that has a defining chorus. Um, before that, blues was a John Lomax, Alan's father, folklorist, first real, really the first folklorist to really be interested in American stuff rather than mining Americans for historic English stuff, which was what earlier folklorists had done here. Um, he referred to blues as one song. He, ref he referred to the blue blues, you know, sometimes called the railroad blues or the Dallas blues or the this blues or the that blues, but it was all a single song. Um, Dave Van Ronk, who I will cite frequently, he was my mentor and everything I know on earth I learned from Dave Van Ronk, pretty much true, um, used to say blues is like a kielbasa. You don't sing a whole one, you just cut off a chunk. Um, he was a great cook, too, I should just... <laughs> that was the sort of simile that would come to his mind. Uh, and I called Chapter 2 Hesitation Blues because Jelly Roll Morton is singing that song. He, he had... So the way the Library of Congress sessions happened is actually interesting. Jelly Roll Morton, by 1938, was down on his luck. He was running a club in Washington, D.C., some jazz fans discovered him. Somebody brought Alan Lomax down and introduced him. And Morton thought, oh, this guy is the guy who does the archive of music of the Library of Congress. He needs to record me because I know the history of everything and it needs to be preserved. So Morton went to Lomax. Lomax did not come to Morton. Morton showed up at the Library of Congress and said, you should start recording me. I can give you the full history of jazz. And Lomax's reaction was, I don't want that. Jazz, and jazz is what is destroying the true American folk music. Um, but he decided to, he, he asked Morton if Morton knew a version of Alabama Bound, and Morton sang what Lomax remembered as the most beautiful version he'd ever heard of it. And he decided, OK, let's give this a shot. And then, Loma and then Morton turned out to be one of the world's great storytellers, which he really is. If you haven't heard the Library of Congress recordings, you have a treat in store. So anyway, so they recorded eight hours of, of Morton's memoirs interspersed with, with songs. Um, and around our, I don't know, three, he does hesitation blues, and partway through it, he starts a verse. Um, 
you see that gal sitting on the stump, you see that gal sitting on the stump. Oh, can't sing that, that's a dirty verse. <laughs> and Lomax is like, no, go ahead. And Morton is, no, can't do it, there's a the lady present. You hear the lady in the background go, don't mind me. <laughs> but in any case, she doesn't do it. So that's Hesitation Blues. It's perfect for the name of that chapter where we discuss the process by which these things get suppressed, which is not just censorship, but also self-censorship. And you have infinite examples. You know, once when I started looking, not only did I find stuff, but I found people saying why I didn't find stuff. There's a woman whose name I'm forgetting right now because I'm 65 years old and I'm beginning to lose all proper names. No, I don't have it. Um, who did a book on songs along the Mississippi River who describes, you know, the guys who would say, yeah, I know some of those old Rouster songs, but I wouldn't sing in front of a nice lady like you. So there we have a whole thing that's lost. Um, I have to say in the context of this book, the losses are much more in the other direction. Uh, in the context of blues, the much larger problem is women who won't sing for male collectors. Um, and one thing that I go into over and over in this book is blues was women's music. Blues historically always down to today when the, the blues that sells to black audiences, the audiences are female. I mean, today, if you go to a blues concert where the entire audience is black, it will be 75 to 80 percent women. Um, and that was always true. And in the case of New Orleans and the first wave of blues, which, by the way, I would argue that blues, as we know it, came together, New Orleans and the Gulf Coast, New Orleans, Biloxi, along there, and went up the river to Mississippi, um, depending on how you define blues, and that's not where we're going right now. Uh, but... All of the early jazz guys talked about blues as what they would play late at night for the women who did sex work after they were off work. And that is also a huge part of this book because that was the world in which a lot of this came up, in which a lot of this music came up. A lot of the singers were women, but more importantly, a sh the audience was overwhelmingly women. And if you look at the lyrics of the song, the quote, dirty songs, that is the songs that talk about sex, one of the interesting things about them is we talk about sex work, that term is often treated as a euphemism, like we're not saying prostitution, we're saying sex work. But in the songs, they're overwhelmingly about the work not about the sex. Um, so for example, I mean, there's a song that uh, Jelly Roll Morton described as, no doubt the first blues I ever heard in my life. He said it was sung by a woman named Mamie Desdunes. And uh, Alan Lomax just called it Mamie's Blues. Say that 219 took my babe away. Well, the 217 bring her back someday. Well, she stood on the corner with her feet all soaking wet. Yeah, she stood on the corner, her feet all soaking wet. She was begging each and every man she met. 
Said you can't spare a dollar, just give me one lousy dime. Said if you can't spend a dollar, just give me a lousy dime. Cause I've just got to feed that hungry man of mine. That verse everywhere, all across the South, up to Chicago, over and over and over. The street, a uh, street walking, the street walking story, and a couple of things about that. When I do it, it's kind of mournful. Um, but if that was a, so much of blues is in its on its home turf, funny. Um, I mean, Dave Van Rock used to tell a story about being at a, at a blues festival and closing with this version of Hoochie Coochie Man, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. And he did it as this huge macho boasting thing. And he walked off stage and Muddy Waters was sitting there. He had not realized Muddy Waters was going to be present. And he says he was very nice about it. He says, he put his hand on my, he said, son, that was very good. But you know, that's supposed to be a funny song. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, that's true of a, so much of this stuff. I mean, Robert Johnson, going to bury my body by the highway side so my old restless spirit can catch a Greyhound bus and ride. <laughs> that's a funny line. That is not a desperate line. But also a lot of lines that just sound nasty are funny lines. It's like gangster rap. I mean, anybody who listens to Fuck the Police and doesn't see that it's a comedy routine <coughs> isn't paying attention. Um, I suppose I should sing something genuinely dirty, shouldn't I? Since, yeah, I figure. Actually, being adults doesn't help. The adults are the ones who object. The kids are OK with all of this stuff. Um, I, and I have to say, I mean, this book, and I also did a book on the dozens, and the fact that the Jelly Roll Morton recordings were came out, all of this is due to rap. I mean, rap has suddenly made it possible to have all these conversations we couldn't have before. And it also has completely reshaped, to me, what's interesting historically. And before I sing something dirty, I'm going to now get academic for a moment. Several moments, what the hell. Um, history is not what happened in the past. History is what is interesting to us in the present about what happened in the past. And because of that, history keeps changing as the present changes. And the history of jazz was and early jazz and blues was written first of all in the swing era and then in the rock and roll era and then in the rock era and in all those periods what was interesting was the music so for example when i start listening to all these interviews with old new orleans guys they keep talk like kid ori talks about having played with a guy named george the rhymer and the more I'm reading, all these people are referring to this guy as the most popular performer in the area around the district. Uh, by the way, Storyville was a tourist term. No one called it that, you know, of New Orleans people. It was the district. George the Rhymer. Um, and once I s got interested, I found all these people talking about him because he was, he was the big star there. His thing was, he played bass, but he apparently didn't actually play bass. He, he just strung it with sash cord, and he used it as a prop. Um, he apparently, or he said he also played guitar, but not in any interesting way. His thing was, he could generate rhymes infinitely, and he could rhyme on anybody's name. And he would get, he would ask the people running the joint who the rich guys were in the room, what their names were, what they did for a living, and he'd rhyme on them. And as the guy said, you know, well, naturally after he rhymed on you, you'd reach for your wallet. Um, 
no jazz history mentions him. It isn't that they, I mean, the people who wrote the jazz histories read the same interviews I read, but that wasn't interesting. Now, in the age of rap and hip hop, that's interesting. And Morton was the same way. Pops Foster, who was a great bass player, said that's what Morton was known for in the district, was that he could rhyme on anything. Said you just, you walk past the place he was playing, he'd get off a dirty rhyme on your name. These guys were freestylers. Um, in any case, speaking of dirty rhymes, uh, so Jelly Roll Morton, first of all, he had three careers. He's known now for his career as a jazz musician, which starts around 1920. Before that, he had spent roughly 10 years as a vaudeville comedian and uh, booking traveling shows and running nightclubs, um, doing blackface comedy. And before that, he had been a traveling blues singer and piano player. That's one of the fascinating things about his history of blues. He stopped doing blues around 1910, 1911, just before W.C. Handy turned it blues into a craze. So his idea of blues is sort of this preserved in amber version of what it was when it was still purely oral culture. Um, and back in those days, he was named Jelly Roll. He, got, he took that name when he was in vaudeville. He was known as Winding Ball. Um, and he had a theme song, which, due to the way he pronounced it when he sang, has been remembered as Winin' Boy. But it was Winding Ball, and when you listen to the interviews, he says Winding Ball, and it went, you know, huh? I'm the Winding Ball, I don't deny my name. Said I'm the winding ball, don't deny my name. Say my name. I'm the winding ball, don't deny my name. Just take it up and shake it like Stephen Chain. I'm the winding ball, don't deny my name. Said I've got a girl, lives behind the jail. Well, I've got a woman lives back of the jail, the jail. Well, I know a woman lives behind the jail, got a sign on her window, good pussy for sale. I'm the winding ball, and I don't deny my name. Uh, incidentally, the first time he sang, he sings good cabbage for sale. But later on, as it goes on, it turned, he... Yeah, exactly. Um, so Stave and Chain, the wine ball, don't deny my name, pick it up and save it, uh, shake it like Stave and Chain. So shortly I'm looking at all these versions of Stave and Chain, which is also a song. And one of them is um, Stave and Chain, what was it? Stephen Chain was a man like this. He'd stand on the corner and wind his fist. Wind, as in winding ball, um, is also a euphemism. It, to wind something or somebody, to wind his fist. Um, so Mance Lipscomb had another, actually uh, uh, Zora Neale Hurston sang that verse for Uncle Bud. Uncle Bud's a man, a man like this. Can't find a woman, he'd fuck his fist. Uncle Bud, Uncle Bud. Um, which man Slipscomb, the Texas blues man, did that verse as well, but expanded it with an image that I'm afraid once I sing it, you will never be able to get it out of your head. But it's, yeah. Get a woman, he'd fuck his fist. Fuck his fist, he'd sling his slime. Save his money for the hard time. Somebody ought to do like Stephen Chain. 
Somebody ought to do like Papa Stephen Chain. Now, Mama, Mama, look at Sis. She's out in the backyard doing that twist. Now, come in, Sis, and you come in fast. Stop that shaking your yes, yes, yes. Yeah, you're trying to do like Stephen Chain. Yeah, you're trying to do like a papa Stephen Chain. Then she talked about her brother and said, uh, Mama, Mama, look at Bud. Out in the back of trying to act like a stud, yeah. Pull his britches down below his knees and he's shaking his prick at who he please. Now he's trying to do like Stephen Chain. Well, he's trying to do like Papa Stephen Chain. And again, all these verses were known everywhere across the South. So uh, what time is it getting to be? I, I'm just doing an hour, then you guys are taking over. Um, what is it? Perfect. We're doing very nicely now. I am going to leave time for conversation because I'm interested in what you guys want to ask about. So I'm going to just just to run a little bit more what the book does. So, yeah, so there's a chapter called Mamie's Blues, which is basically on the women who were, and the, the sex work and that world, which um, the thing that I really wanted to underline in that section is... And I should say, this is the, in the last 10 or 15 years, there have been a whole bunch of really terrific, terrific books. Saidia Hartman is probably the best known writer who's been working this area, looking at the black sporting world and specifically at the women in the black sporting world and talking about, because, you know, Virtually all writing about prostitution is treating the women as victims. And there's been a lot of more recent writing saying, yeah, it was, it was a terrible goddamn work. It was not a good life. But given the options available to black women or indeed working class women in the, early, in the late 19th, early 20th century, it was a perfectly reasonable choice. And it had possibilities for moving up that were not there in virtually any other profession. So that, you know, if you were taking in washing, you did not end up with a millionaire laundry business. Most women who went into prostitution did not end up rich, and it was a miserable life. But there were in every city in America, some very, very wealthy women who had worked up that way. And in the French, in, in the, the districts in New Orleans, that history has been written over and over and over again by jazz fans. And you might have the idea that the important people in the district were King Oliver and Buddy Bolton and so forth and so on. But the important people in the district, in the interviews with all the people who were living in that world, were people like Eloise Blankenstein and Louise Abadie and Mary Porter and uh, my favorite, a woman named Reddy Money, uh, Mabel, Mabel Robbins when she was in New Orleans. And I got absolutely fascinated with her. This is another project I need to go in more deeply. She only has a page and a half in this book. But... Jelly Roll Morton talks about her just as ready money. Um, she was with, her partner was a man named Bob Rowe. Bob Rowe ran the gambling at the Big 25 in the district, which was one of the big gambling halls. And he describes uh, ready money as a pickpocket, as an expert thief who could get in your pocket and you wouldn't know and get anything out of it. I did not expect to be able to find out much more about ready money. Well, <laughs> um, as it turns out, Ready Money first shows up in the news in 1893 in St. Louis together with a woman named Betty Ray, who went on to be the biggest black madam in St. Louis and reportedly had Scott Joplin as her house piano player. 
In any case, Ready Money was only there briefly. At that point, she was named Mabel Tyler. Um, by 1897, she turns up in Kansas City with another woman, having just pulled off a $7,000 robbery in New York, $7,000 in 1897. Yes, lots of goddamn money. Um, they, the New York cops didn't follow it up, so they just ran her and her friend out of town. She next gets arrested in Chicago, Portland, Oregon. Uh, then she shows up in, uh, in Arkansas. Then she's in New Orleans. In New Orleans, she was there from, she was in New Orleans by uh, 1904. She's there till 1912. She's listed in the blue books. Um, small digression. There, prostitution in the first half uh, first, in the first decade of the 20th century was not only a big business, it was a very visible business. Um, the Tenderloin in New York ran from roughly 14th Street to 50th and was three blocks wide. And that was one of five district, red light districts in New York. And in New Orleans and in Mobile and in Chicago, they actually published guides to the prostitutes in the houses of prostitution. The New Orleans guides were published every year. They're called Blue Books. You can see them online from the historic New Orleans collection who's put them all online. And they list all the women and their addresses and their race, which I am digressing for a moment here because that one I wasn't ready for. Uh, w for white women, C for colored, O for octoroon, which literally meant one-eighth black, but in fact meant could pass for white, but we know is in fact black, and J for Jewish, which was also a salable category. That was the one I wasn't expecting. Um, so anyway, so Ready Money is in the blue books from 1906 to 1912, at which point she leaves New Orleans, her and Bob Rowe, and to make a long story short, by 1930, she owned the largest black-owned hotel in south of between Los Angeles and Tijuana, the Douglas Hotel in San Diego with a nightclub downstairs called the Creole Palace and a staff of 60, um, and continued to run it into the 1950s. And it was the big black nightclub and hotel in Southern California. There, literally has never been a paragraph written about this woman. Mm -hmm. um, and there are all those, these stories like that that just have never been written up just because nobody writes them up, not because... So this project took me into a lot of stuff like, you know, I was interested in what's the world that produces these songs. All the songs about, you know, once you start thinking... So all these jazz guys say that they were playing the music for the sex workers after they got off work. And in that world, by the way, this was a completely respectable profession. I mean, Louis Armstrong, in his memoir, says his mother was probably doing sex work. The specific sentence in the original draft was, if my mother was selling fish, I've, nev I've never been sure. Um, uh, that was changed for the printed edition. But the printed edition does describe his first wife as the prettiest and finest whore in, in uh, what's it called? Al oh, the area right across the, the river from New Orleans. Algiers, in Algiers, yeah. Um, that was a point of pride. And... So anyway, reading about that, and then you start looking at the lyrics, and you go, yeah, there are all these lyrics about lesbianism and cunnilingus. What would you sing for a group of sex workers after work? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so I'm gonna sing, um, So anyway, then there's a chapter. It's, it's named for Pallet on the Floor, which is actually a long, genuinely filthy song that Jelly Roll Morton did that, again, Pallet on the Floor is a song we've all, if you've heard blues, you've heard Pallet on the Floor, but Jelly Roll Morton does it as a narrative, and it's 15 minutes long. And it's a narrative of a hustling man 
and a working man's wife um, or working man's woman. And it is extremely graphic about how they spend their afternoon while the working man is away. And again, I mean, this is a comic piece for people in the sporting world to laugh at the treatment of the working man who is the, you know, it's the cuckold. It's the classic back to Chaucer figure of fun. Um, but anyway, I use that as a hook to just talk about the songs that actually do deal with sex and sexuality, the songs about lesbianism, um, the songs about all, all sorts of gay sex, and that's another oddity. There is not a single book on male homosexuality in New Orleans. There are histories of male homosexuality in Chicago, in New York, in San Francisco, less actually. Chicago and New York are the main histories. And New Orleans has always been a gay center. So I actually went through a period of writing to all the, the gay historians or early 20th century stuff saying, is there really nothing about New Orleans? And got back all these letters saying, huh, that's weird. You're right. No, <laughs> we haven't found a book that, you know, if somebody here wants to write an interesting book, there's an interesting book there to be written. But that leads to the interesting question. There are all these blues songs about lesbianism, virtually none about male homosexuality. Is that because there were more blues songs about lesbianism because it's a female audience? Or is it because we just don't have the songs that were being sung in all the gay male bars? Um, Tony Jackson, who Jelly Roll Morton described as the best single hand entertainer in America, who was in New Orleans, left New Orleans for Chicago because he was gay. And Chicago was a better place to be gay at that time, according to Jelly Roll. Um, but people talk about how Jelly Roll talked about a place called the Frenchman's where people would go late at night, the, all the good piano players, and trade, trade music. And a number of other people talk about the Frenchman as specifically a gay hangout where Tony Jackson and his crowd would go. Um, what did he play? I will say his most famous tune was a tune called Pretty Baby, which the original lyric was, you can talk about your jelly rolls. Jelly roll, incidentally, was a euphemism for typically for female genitalia. You can talk about your jelly rolls, but none of them compare with my baby, which given that context is a very different song. Um, so anyway, there's a chapter on that. It's, it, the book uses all these songs essentially as an attempt to explore m the music that was suppressed and the world the music came out of, which was also suppressed. It's sort of an attempt to look at, to say, I, I recently got a, I recently went back into academia having dropped out after one year of college and actually took a degree in sociolinguistics. So this, this stuff interests me. Um, and basically, what I was thinking is, you know, if you suppress the way people talk, you are suppressing their entire culture. And say, you know, once you, it may seem very, very minor to suppress, you know, the word fuck. But if you are disrespecting the way people talk, and virtually every working class situation, people use words like that, you are saying that the culture is not, that you can't respect the culture. And I should emphasize, this is not about black culture or white culture. I mean, the one well-known song, blues song, that deals with male homosexuality, this thing by Kokomo Arnold called Sissy Man Blues. Incidentally, it made the name of an incredible documentary that came out last year called uh, Kokomo City, which if you have not seen it, I really recommend. It's phenomenal. It's by a black trans woman, ex-sex worker, director about the world of black trans women sex workers. And it's phenomenal. I'm not just as a document. I mean, it's phenomenally filmed, the whole thing. But she named it Kokomo City after Kokomo Arnold's Sissy Man Blues, which has the verse, 
woke up this morning with my pork grinding business in my hand. If you can't, if, if Lord, if you can't send me a woman, send me a sissy man. Um, which immediately for me reminded me of a song my father used to sing. Uh, my father was born in 1906, which gave me a, gives me a very direct connection to the period we're talking about, and worked a couple of summers on a freighter uh, between New York and Buenos Aires and learned a certain amount of culture in that environment. Um, and he had a song that began, Tiddlywinks, young man, get a fuck if you can. If you can't get a woman, get a clean old man. And it went on from there. Um, so again, universal themes. So, Uh, and then the last chapter actually goes completely in a different direction because, as I say, the whole thing was, was my, this whole project for me started with the murder ballad. And I got fascinated with the whole thing of, of black murder ballads, which is a very weird historical thing because with maybe one exception, all the black murder ballads that circulated all over the United States come from the 1890s. All the recordings we have of them are from the 20s, 30s, and later. But the murders were all from the 1890s, be it Lewis Collins, Staggerly, Frankie and Johnny, Duncan and Brady, Delia. Um, there are several others. They're all from the 1890s. It's all a period just before blues. And I understand what's happening in the murder ballad, the Jelly Roll Morton murder ballad, which is in 12-bar blues form, to be a, probably a style that existed for about yay long as ballads were going out of fashion and blues was coming in. And blues is actually not a good form for a long ballad because the way blues works is you have these two repeated lines, the standard 12-bar blues. You have two repeated lines and then a third that rhymes which is a great form for making shit up. Because you sing, you know, playing here in, tonight in Bird and Beckett, and then you say that again, and that gives you enough time to think of, I don't know, I would try to come up with a way to rhyme with, I don't know, check it, something. But you have time, because you're repeating that first one twice. If you're doing an epic ballad, repeating everything twice, it really gets to drag. <laughs> so my theory is that this is a form that dies out in that moment. But yeah, the, there was that whole world of those ballads. And the three most famous ones all across the South, Staggerly, Frankie and Johnny, and Duncan and Brady, uh, all happened in St. Louis within five years of each other. And when... Frankie Baker, or Frankie and Johnny, it was actually Frankie and Albert originally. Um, sh when Mae West made the movie where she sings that, Frankie Baker took her to court. And so suddenly in the 1930s, we have all these court, th this court case in St. Louis with all these people testifying about the original killing and how the song happened. And they're testifying that there was a guy, oh yeah, who used to write these things down and sell them as broadsides for 10 cents each. And my guess is that that's what's going on, that there was in fact a broadside market in St. Louis and we just don't have any of the original broadsides, which would be typical. We have virtually no broadsides from the 1890s. And that they just then you know, went feral in the countryside. Anyway, I've talked enough. I'm going to sing one more thing, and then we can have a little conversation. Um, this is a song by a, wo a woman named Bertha Idaho recorded it about the red light district in Baltimore, and it's just a good place to end because, again, it's about that world. It's a very discreet, well. Gonna tell you about a street I know In the city of Baltimore and every night about half past eight The broads that stroll the weather up to date You can see them every night down on Pennsylvania Avenue 
Let's take a trip down to a cabaret Where they turn the night into day Some freakish sights you're sure to see You can't tell the he's from the she's But they're there every night down on Pennsylvania Avenue And Deacon Johnson, he lost his wife He couldn't preach for grief and strife You know he felt so all alone and blue He had no one to tell his troubles to Till he found her one night down on Pennsylvania Avenue Broads are broken, can't make rent. Get good loving there for 50 cents. You can get it anytime down on Pennsylvania Avenue. And again, that last verse. You find versions all across the South. You find some sung by women more sympathetic to the problem being expressed, some by men jeering at it. Um, there's also this whole cycle that I found at least a half dozen versions of about the economic conditions in different towns and the relative price of in the, the women's version, pussy, but in some other versions, dock work. We are talking work. So you had a dock worker's version. You had a sex worker's version. And always ending with the local town, wherever it was, down here, they might as well be dead working for fish and bread, um, which, again, becomes a proverbial thing. Um, anyway, I've talked enough. What do people, yeah. Um, the answer is anything that's been recorded, You not anything, but most of what's been recorded you can find on YouTube. We're living in a wonderful era for that. A lot of the stuff I'm citing, no, uh, because it wasn't recorded. I mean, I'm, I'm basically, you know, that's, as I said at the beginning, you know, that's one of the issues that we're dealing with, that people write history based on recordings, even when they're writing about stuff that we all know wasn't recorded. Um, which has completely messed up the historical record. Uh, so, no, a huge proportion of the lyrics in this book, so far you ain't going to find anywhere else. Um, I'm One of the purposes of this book was to point a big arrow towards the fact that all this stuff is out there, and I hope we're going to see a hell of a lot more of it surfacing um, I mean, I do cite a lot of things that were recorded and those you can all find, and I have elaborate footnotes. So, I mean, everything, my source is there. If it was a record, you've got the title of the record and you can find it on YouTube. Yeah. So, if he was still alive, who would be Dave Van Ronk's favorite rapper? <laughs> and who's your favorite rapper? Okay, um, first of all, uh, he did not like this stuff. Um, somebody the other day asked me, so what would Jelly Roll Morton think of the people today? And Jelly Roll Morton, I can give you a clearer answer. Jelly Roll Morton would say it was absolute junk, and we were doing that back in New Orleans already back in 1905. Um, this isn't a general thing. I mean, I talked to Orlandus Wilson, who was one of the four original members of the Golden Gate Quartet, and his whole thing is, we invented rap in, in the 1930s. 
And he said that proudly with no hint of, and it's turned into junk. Um, Van Ronk, I mean, Van Ronk's position was a little more complicated. Uh, Van Ronk's position was the only real folk music uh, in New York right now is rap. But that didn't mean he liked it. He liked Cole Porter. Uh, goody Mob. I mean, I'm basically a blues guy. Uh -huh. And Goody Mob's Soul Food record uh -huh. is to me sort of the high point of rap connecting with its roots in the stuff I really like. Uh -huh. Sure. Any other questions, comments, whatever, before we start turning the stage over to other people? Yeah. What about the last poets? I, I'm, the last poets are among the many people who were mining the black toast tradition before it surfaced as rap. Um, I mean, that tradition is infinitely deep. And they mined it in a brilliant way, as did Bo Diddley, as did people back to the 30s. Um, I mean, the, the to it was called toasting, normally, toasts. And the toast tradition, Stagalee was, was an epic toast, Shine and the Titanic, the Signifying Monkey. Um, and all of that stuff, no one knows how. The earliest reports of those things are from the 40s. But who knows how far back they go. Willie Dixon. The Chicago songwriter, Chicago, the Chicago blues songwriter, said that when he was in high school, he made money printing up filthy versions of Signifying Monkey and selling them to his friends and other people. And he then cleaned that up and called it the Jungle King. And it's the first serious copyright Willie Dixon had. Cab Calloway did it. Um, before Willie Dixon is writing stuff for Howlin' Wolf and, and Muddy Waters, Cab Calloway did his version of The Jungle King, which was, as I say, a sanitized version of Signifying Monkey. So, I mean, that was around. The last poets are, are a moment in it. Rudy Ray Moore is a very, for people who don't, uh, how many people here know Rudy Ray Moore's work? For the people who don't know his work, Eddie Murphy starred in a movie about him a few years ago that is, I think, the only movie I've ever seen about a performer where the performance in the movie is significantly better than the original that the movie is about. Because Eddie Murphy is a hell of a lot better with his timing than Rudy Ray Moore was. And Eddie Murphy doing Rudy Ray Moore is just terrific. I loved that movie. Somebody remembered? It may have just been, was it just called Dolomite? Dolomite. Really fun movie, historically pretty accurate, and Eddie Murphy is so good at doing that material. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, well. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not exactly ducking that. A lot of this stuff, you know, asking for, it, it, for the meanings of term, sexual terms in oral culture, very often there's no good answer because people use them in all sorts of ways. I mean, jelly roll, is it male genitalia, female genitalia, the act of sexuality? I mean, my first chapter, I deal with the term hog eye, which is a term that you will not find in any dictionary or any source of any kind other than songs going back to one mentioned in 12 Years a Slave. It means either anus or vulva. I think more generally anus. And it exists still in, as ojo de puerco in, in Mexican Spanish. So my case is fairly strong, but there are examples of hog eye lyrics where it clearly doesn't, where it clearly means vulva. Um, does it? Oh, good. Which does it say it means? Uh, anal. Yeah, okay. 
Um, there are songs, however, where it means vulva. And that one, again, it can be hog eye, it can be brown eye, which clearly we're talking anus. Um, I first came across it in Ernest Hemingway in uh, um, Movable Feast, where he refers to the wolves that you had to avoid when you were a young boy around the, the boatmen in Michigan who uh, would describe their sexual preference as gash is fine, but one eye for mine. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> anyway, and on that note, right, we will turn it over to some more prudent. <laughs> Thank you. And I'm happy to sign them. And I should say one further thing, which is I have never said this for anything else that I've written, but the audio book, I had some input. They've never given me that before. The audio book is read by a black woman named Mello Lee. And this book in a black woman's voice is really good. <laughs> um, she was. She showed up for my reading in, in L.A., and we did a whole back and forth, and she's wonderful. So I'm not saying don't. You clearly need the print book. <laughs> <laughs> and you, in fact, need it here and yeah, signed. Yeah, yeah, right. But you also want to have the audio book. You can't sign an audio book. <laughs> you can't sign an audio book. Exactly. All right, thanks, Elijah. Thank you all for coming out. Now, we do have a uh, concert at 7.30, so musicians will be coming through. The first 20 seats up here, we're going to reserve for the people to call ahead, and we'll shift things around. But if you call for a minute, we'll move up to the back. And if you have I know you're Rick. I can recognize you. Yeah. So glad you made it down. Hi there. Hi. Pleased to meet you. Yeah.